This video is brought to you by Viking Jewelry. You all know who the Vikings and the Normans are. Well, let's see if today I can bring something to the table that you are probably aware of, but you never really looked at it this way. Hello and hello everyone, so welcome back to my channel, this is the Metatron speaking and hopefully today's video will bring a sort of new perspective on both the Vikings and the Normans and at the same time give us some food for thought when it comes to societal conventions. In other words, we'll try to understand up to what extent Vikings and Normans are different people. These two words are clearly related. A Norman, aka a Northman, is a man from the North. Well, by definition, all Vikings were men from the north who went on Vikings. Also because by north, the medieval people who invented this word meant specifically the Nordic countries where Vikings came from. So, is a Norman just a Viking who relocated to northern France, or should I say, Francia? Well, no, there are clearly differences, particularly pertaining to the fields of religion, culture and linguistics. See, the Vikings, or should we say the Norse, were pagan, the Normans were Christians. The Vikings spoke Old Norse, the Normans spoke Norman French. When engaged in pitch battles, the Vikings tended to fight on foot, whereas the Normans adopted Frankish cavalry tactics and probably drank wine. In light of all this, the question still remains, even if in a slightly different form. When, and most importantly, how did the Vikings who settled in Normandy become Normans? To properly answer that, we'll talk about political incorporation, legal manipulation and religion utilised as a socio-political conduit. All of these factors will act as a basis for discussing and understanding the emergence of ethnic identities, and more specifically ethnogenesis within the context of medieval European religion and law. What is a people? What defines a people? Culture, language, geographic provenance, genetic continuity. When does a Viking end and a Norman begin? The primary aim of this video is to assess how medieval rulers were able to legitimize and effectively transform entire people from monstrous foreign invaders to lawful Christianized subjects under the feudal system. A thorough inspection of the medieval socio-political framework through a deep dive into the historical context is of course necessary. I'll try to make that concise. And here is the kicker. The most jaw-dropping aspect of this video is the realization of how powerful a denonym can be. Let's test it. The following statement probably won't sound weird at all. The Norse, whom I'll call Vikings for ease of use, during the Viking Age between 793 and 1066 constantly raided the coasts of England and continental Europe. The Vikings then begin to settle in England. In 1066, the Normans invade and conquer Anglo-Saxon England. The Hundred Years' War, fought between 1337 and 1453, was a series of armed conflicts between the Kingdom of England and France during the late Middle Ages. For instance, the Battle of Formini, fought on the 15th of April 1450, was a major battle of the Hundred Years' War. Alright, nothing really strange about that. We've got five different words. Anglo-Saxons, Vikings, Normans, English, French, this is medieval Europe you're talking about, it's not so strange that people from different countries are trying to kill each other. Now check this out. The Vikings during the Viking Age, between 793 and 1066, constantly raided the coasts of England and continental Europe. The same Vikings then began to settle in England and now live there under the so-called Dane law. In 1066, the same Vikings who now became the Normans invade and conquer England, where other Vikings had settled. The Hundred Years' War, fought between 1337 and 1453, was a series of armed conflicts between the Kingdom of England, which derived from the Anglo-Normans, now invaded France during the late Middle Ages. The Battle of Formini, fought in Normandy on 15th of April 1450, was a major battle of the Hundred Years' War. If you really pause for a moment to really think about this, no matter how you look at it in different percentages, of course, the Vikings, whether it be through ancestral lineage or direct action, have something to do with all of these conflicts. We just don't see it as clearly because of the names we use. Now, of course, I'm taking some liberties here, but all of this leads to another very pertinent question. If we were to ask a medieval person, who are the Vikings? or well, depending on who you're asking and when, the answer might vary dramatically. Pirates, plunderers, able explorers, traders, navigators, colonists, warriors, invaders, monsters, demons, allies, ancestors. And if we bring medieval monks into the picture, we'll get ready for the heavy words. The Vikings in Normandy become French, the Vikings in England become English, and then between these two people, who are in fact connected, a war begins. In April 1066, the Halley Comet appears. An illustration of this celestial primordial object to the inner solar system even appears on the Bayeux tapestry. 
approaching within 9 million miles of Earth. Medieval observers in England saw it as a bad omen, while Duke William of Normandy believed it was a positive sign from heaven. In late September, William's army landed in England, and on October 14, 1066, he defeated Harold's army at the Battle of Hastings. The resulting Battle of Hastings was one of the longest battles of all times, and all Europeans were horrified as it was a carnage. Normally, the 6th century AD is characterized by the fall of the Western Roman Empire, political instability and migrations of people. Medieval kingdoms at this time didn't only have domestic troubles, foreign policy was an extremely complicated mess to entangle. And during this long period of change, at the end of the 8th century, the Vikings appear on European shores. When we look at the effects of Norse activity on the British Isles and continental Europe, we see that it results in a significant reshaping of social and political power. The increased pressures of relentless Scandinavian attacks, the appearance of the great heathen army of 865 evolve, the latent threat from overseas, from raising to colonizing. While English authorities try all sorts of ways to manage the situation, from payment to negotiation to battle. So a mechanism is devised through ecclesiastical allegiance, an ethnic absorption within the Anglo-Saxon social fabric and political spheres. A cohesive identity will be the key to solve a problem that appears otherwise to be unsolvable. Comprehensive details of each aspect of their lives are unfortunately lacking, but one thing we do know for sure, the Vikings and their rulers went from demonic invaders to lawful Christianized kings overnight. This was an act of wide cultural repercussion. At the hands of the Anglo-Saxon kings and clergy within law code, a new identity was created. Now, if we were to examine deeply the, say, Alfred Guthrum Treaty, or the Wantage Code, with the aim of further establishing an analytical framework of reference to study the power dynamics and power relationships which are often hidden, even the most basic attempt at understanding the legal language would extend the discussion into the domain of discourse analysis, as several extralinguistic factors such as language, culture and ideology will play a pivotal role in our examination. The new Anglo-Scandinavian ethnicity was born, and with it, equilibrium. Breaking the fourth wall for a moment as I'm editing my video, yes I edit wearing my arm in doublet, but I'd like to take a moment to mention the kind sponsor that made this video possible, Viking Jewelry. Viking Jewelry is one of my historic sponsors in the sense that they've been sponsoring my channel and my work since I had something like a thousand subscribers, so I'll always be happy to mention their amazing online shop and talking about that, let me show you the kind of goods that they provide. They have amazing rings, they've got wooden watches and one of my favourite things is their t-shirt line, which is based on Norse mythology such as my favorite one representing the tree Yggdrasil. But you'll find all sorts of high quality merchandise on their website which has been handmade in Spain, Italy and France. Now the 15th is Mother Day so they have got a special 30% discount on their first line collection using the code MOTHER and you can use the code NOBLE1 for a 10% discount from their entire store which includes of course my own ring that as you know they are the ones producing. And I know that I've been speaking about this ring a lot in the last few uploads but that's because I'm really excited about it. So you can also get a 10% discount on my ring as well. But be quick because these discounts will be available until the 15th. And as always, big thanks to Viking Jewelry for sponsoring my video. A very similar situation, an almost analogous stratagem is adopted in Francia where, once again, more Vikings led by the Viking leader Rollo arrive at the shores. As the Vikings keep creating trouble, attacking places, creating settlements nearby the rivers, the Frankish kings and local authorities are already trying to manage all sorts of external pressures and delicate political balances decide to approach Rollo and the Vikings and try to come up with a pact. Was given land in exchange for a pact of fealty. This land, which will be in the northern section of France, is what we call today Normandy, the land of the Northmen. Rollo and his descendants tried to explore several possible ways to infiltrate and integrate with the existing communities. The newly minted Normans, which adopted Carolingian titles and political power, allied themselves with the church, became once again Christians, cementing their position within European power dynamics. If Rollo and his Vikings didn't actually try to find a way to create the Normans, what would have happened is that a upper class or ruling Viking who had taken control of Normandy in an unjust way would have been ruling over a distraught and generally speaking pissed off Frankish local original population or native. And this problem would have continued for generations, even the following children and children of children would have been like, yeah, but this was our land, we are Frankish, they are Vikings, why are they over us? If they all become Normans, 
if the upper class and the ruling class are Normans and the ruled or subjugated class are also Normans and that's different and with the aid of both secular and religious authority by a couple of generations no one would have even remembered we are all Normans. The point of reflection that I'm trying to draw with this video will be even more evident once we touch upon linguistics. Look at the language we're using here on this video, English. What would have English sounded like if the Vikings had never left their countries? No, really think about it. English as we speak it today, even though it belongs to the Germanic language family, has more than 40% of its vocabulary being Latin rooted. This is probably one of the reasons why English has become the de facto lingua franca, very similar to the common in D&D. That is because in Western Europe, English is the perfect middle language between the two main linguistic realities, the Germanic and the Romance. Similarly enough, the Germanic languages in its roots, etymology, structure and syntax for Germanic people to learn it easily, and close enough to Latin languages because of its overwhelming Latin vocabulary for Romance speakers like me to learn it. The Roman invasion of Britain has of course something to do with this lending of vocabulary. For example, words such as wine come from winum and wall comes from wallum. But a lot of the Latin rooted vocabulary that we do use in the English language actually comes from the Normans after 1066. And if you take a moment for self-reflection in the very vocabulary you use on a daily basis, you are both representing the Anglo-Saxon world and the Norman world of Norman Britain. Let me give you an example. This double nature of English as a language is immediately expressed in the fact that you oftentimes have two different ways to say the same thing. As a general rule of identification, the Germanic rooted languages tend to be connected more to everyday language and words that you use on a daily basis such as to eat, to drink, to walk, to go. Whereas Latin rooted words which are connected to the Norman words tend to have to do with the upper echelons of society. Look at the words for animals and food. In English you say pig, calf, ram, chicken, all Germanic rooted as it was the Anglo-Saxon people that dealt with the animals. Therefore their vocabulary has reached us. But when you look at the meat of these animals, pork, veal, mutton, poultry, all of these are instead Latin rooted because it was the Norman upper class that generally speaking could afford to eat the animals and therefore their words and their vocabulary for the meats of these animals have reached us and they are the ones we use. Now there are of course exceptions, there are situations whereby we now use in English words that are Latin rooted instead of the Germanic rooted ones more often. Fatigue is more common than weariness and diminish is more common than abate. But in general when we look at the way we speak, we're literally looking into a time mirror into the division of classes and origin of Anglo-Norman England. Many questions today, but my final question for today is what would have happened if the Vikings had never left their countries? The Normans would have never existed. Maybe no duchy in the north of France would have invaded and conquered England. Therefore, English now would be mostly a Germanic language, if not the few words gained from the Romans. You and I, effectively making and watching this video, would be using a completely different sounding language. Norman French would have never been created, which is the only type of French which has literal connection with Scandinavian languages and still retains some vocabulary from Old Norse. Of course, through this question, our imagination bleeds from the realm of historical reality to that of alternative history. But it does support the overall idea that I'm trying to bring forth with this video, that all of the historical events that I've talked about on this video are all connected to the original Vikings leaving their shores. What would Europe look like now? if they never did.